all that on the fries. Actually, there was something I posted on Instagram the other day that literally everyone was like, oh, that's the sickest thing that's ever been made. African dub. African dub? No, the album with the two... Oh, oh right, that's... Yeah, the... yeah, I was it there still. Brian, when you've got the time, I'll pop into the shop or, or return my phone call, yeah? All right, speak to you later. If you have a look behind Iroy, I think there's one there, just on your left. Oh, yeah, this one. I'm going to buy this. All oh, right. <laughs> okay. The kind of thread that goes across everything in terms of the music that I play and like my whole life and the cultural element is actually come from my parents' generation. So my mum and my dad came over to London from the Caribbean and my mum came in the 50s. She was part of that kind of first Windrush generation of like Caribbean immigrants who came over, invited over actually by the UK government to help support the post-war economy. They did that through a number of jobs, but then also brought so much more in terms of music, in terms of kind of culture, right across the creative industries as well. I give thanks and praises for being born in London. The ingredients that are in London, without them, we wouldn't have jungle music and we wouldn't have dubstep and we wouldn't have grand. It might be an original over there, which might only be a little bit more expensive, Oh, you know? But get him when you can, because once he stopped pressing him, then that's it. You won't press him again. When I hear jungle music, when I hear grime music, I just hear so much of the generations that have come before, and I hear, like, reggae and I hear, like, dub, and I hear, like, the pain of their parents. I feel those stories. There's that kind of legacy, and it's just, for me personally, coming through um, from that generation. I feel it, like, I feel it so deep within, within me. <laughs> I'm going to cry. <laughs> Can you imagine who I started crying? Um, I feel really, really emotional about it because it's not, just, it's not just about music, it's about people, it's about communities, it's about history, it's about that big, beautiful melting pot. And to me, that like, just symbolises like, the spirit of London so much. All right, look after her, look after her. Yes, please. London is a place that has a high resonance of different frequencies and a lot of pressure. So when you pressurize stone, it becomes a diamond after a period of time. And that's what it's like for Londoners. With Brexit, we've now culturally threatening to close the door to what actually makes London great. It's kind of disgusting, we would say, that we wanted to control immigration when so much of like the great music and great stuff, the great parties are being run in the city, are run by French people and run by Spanish people. And that's just our small little world. You know? There's so much more uh, that we're missing out on by, by closing the door to, to Europe. Once this new deal has been worked out, who knows what will happen? If you had to get a work permit for every EU citizen coming in and working, it could be an absolute nightmare. Anyone like a free paper, free magazine? Ladies, you have a lovely weekend anyway. Have a good one, sir. I read the newspaper more now than ever. So I want to see what mad shit Theresa May or uh, Donald Trump have come up with that day, you know? And for months I was like incandescent and now I'm like, well, it's maybe part of my responsibility to be the one that's reaching out. And I think music can be a part of that healing force of you know, bringing people together. And clubbing is part of that. And I think it's an important and cathartic social experience for, for people to be a part of. So that's what I tell myself, so I keep doing it. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, I like being a part of it, so, yeah.
when I say when after that I come in, pull up, pull up, it's kind of no music. It's like a palace. Yeah, acapella, yeah, pull yeah, up, pull yeah. up. And then we go, they call them nobody, they don't know about that. We pull you down. Yeah, yeah, that's what happens after. Yeah. All right, go for it. I wanted to stick as close to the original stuff as possible, not do like classical kind of versions or jazzy interpretations. I wanted to play jungle, grime or whatever it is, or dubstep or whatever, you know, like be quite true to the, the music itself. I've yet to see Killer P and Flo Dan. I've had a fucking word out of them for two months, nothing, not a peep. So there's so much that could go wrong with this show, so much. And it's like sold out. And this is Pogo Nasty. You alright? But let's just do the same thing again. I'm going to queue in um, Pongo for the for when for his bit, so it should be fine. We've gone from illegal parties in Tottenham to now being in the Royal Festival Hall. That's a serious journey. My love. We're here, of course, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Outlook and their great passion for sound system culture. Right now, please welcome the Outlook Orchestra and your wonderful conductor this evening, Tommy Evans. Woo! Yeah, yeah. Raw Festival, what we there, yeah? Outlook, what we there, yeah? I'm in the world, it's what they get to all, bad man. We did for Manchester, all and that. We did for Nana, Nana, Brickstone. Show my friend, we did for Nana, too. We feel appreciated when somebody else learns how to play that what was made in a bedroom sometimes. To see that it's come so far that we can cross over and be played in such a classy environment and in a classy way. That's a great thing. London used to be a place like, if you made reggae music or bashment music back then, there wasn't a platform for you to be heard. We had to create our own platform. Jungle, drum and bass, grime, UK garage. Like England, we own a lot of good things, blood. The music that's come out of London has inspired the whole world. And you've got the grime youths because of the jungle revolution and because of the sound system revolution. This organic family tree that has been growing, growing, growing until we're here now. Now, one of the UK's most well-known nightclubs is to close permanently after its licence was revoked by Islington Council in North London, which described a culture of drugs at the venue. Let's talk to Cameron Leslie, co-founder and director of Fabric. Um, Cameron, very good evening to you. How can you defend the fact that six young people have died in your establishment? 
fact that six young people have died has a profound impact upon the team here and, and don't underestimate the impact that that has upon us. There are changes in behavioural patterns amongst young people. The strengths of the drugs now are so strong and the conversations are being buried and the venues like ours are so far downstream in terms of facing these challenges, the inevitable, sadly, is, is going to happen. I've always felt like we were doing things in the right way. It's always been something that's really, really important to me. But the kids get treated in the same way that I would want to be treated if I went to a club. You know, that they're just as important as the DJ that's coming to the club. And that's what Fabric's always been about. It's always been anyone experiencing our building has the best and safest, like, experience. And so that's why it was a bit of a, like, oh, you can tell me, you can call me whatever, but don't tell me I'm not doing my job or I'm not looking after people and I'm not keeping people safe because that's always been the key thing. I don't think you could possibly prepare for such a situation when you're, when you're running things as cleanly and as properly as, and as decently as you can um, and then you're told you're not, uh, it's, it's, it is hard to absorb. Since 2012 we've turned over 81 dealers that we found at the door of this club and only one person has been prosecuted. How can you possibly deal with this sort of thing? When you cannot even have education about drugs and, you see, you, and that is seen as incentivating the use of drugs, then you have a big problem there because you're not being able to communicate how to be safe. London won't even discuss the fact about having somewhere to test drugs. But up north, there's a dialogue going on and the police are welcoming this conversation. But in London, they, they won't even acknowledge the conversation. There is a zero tolerance of drugs in London and that's the absolute red line. And you can see the inherent risks with drugs and, and, and what happens when it goes wrong. And you can also see the impact that that has, both in terms of you know, the personal situation for, for families concerned, but also for, for a venue and a business like us that is trying to purvey you know, good quality electronic music, it, you know, it gets shut down accordingly and the impact that that has. Over here was the marketing team, Saul and Remy, who sadly they were um, among those who we had to make, get made redundant. And they used to sit here um, with our bookers for Fabric Live. We used to have Joe here, so we're sort of on yeah, a lower team than usual at the moment. We've been very clear with the team that you know, if we go to that hearing and they revoke the licence, then, you know, we will have no alternative but to, to, to lay, uh, you know, 99% of the company off. And I think that was why at the hearing it was quite emotional for everybody because that decision told everybody what was going to be happening to them the next day. I think we'd lost our licence maybe sort of two or three days. And then all these people started turning up, like kids that used to, you know, come to the club. They started congregating outside and leaving their messages on the door and just wanting to be together. And then one of them called me and said, oh, you know, I just wondered if you want to come down and just say hello to everybody. And that was probably about eight o'clock at night. I ended up down there with them till three o'clock in the morning. Just listening to these kids and listening to their stories and listening to what they had to say about fabric and what it meant to them and what it had given them in their lives. And, and I was sat in the bath the next morning and I was like, all I could think of was everything that these, people, these kids were saying to me. And I was like, you know what, I've got to go into work. I've got to say to my boss, we need to fight this because we need to do it for them. It's my pleasure to announce uh, today uh, London's first ever night star. She's very, very enthusiastic. Uh, she is Amy Levine. Amy. Hello, and uh, thank you very much, Sadi. I am absolutely thrilled to be appointed the night star of London, the first ever night star of London. We want to make sure that London thrives as the most diverse 24-hour city in the world. Fabric is a case study in how surely it's possible for us to get the nightclub owner, the council, the licensing committee, the police, the residents together to discuss these things before it becomes a problem. There is a court case and appeal taking place now. It was the council that made the decision, the license committee, to uh, not renew the uh, uh, license. Obviously, 
you know, Amy's been in job for an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, so, you know, give her a chance to catch her breath. But, you know, we're determined. I'm fed up of a conversation about how do we stop pub A closing down? How do we stop nightclub B closing down? I want the conversation to be, we're opening a new live music venue, we're opening a new nightclub, we're opening a new, you know, bar. That's the sort of conversation we want to be having. My partner Will saw this space two, three years ago. We kind of walked in, didn't really quite know what to expect. I've seen the pictures and the sheer scale of it. I mean, kids in sweet shop was the way to describe us. From the outside, it's quite a, an anonymous, innocuous looking space. It's big, but it's just a sort of big grey box side. But then when you get in, the, the space is pretty nuts. The potential of the space is incredible. And this is the part of the building that I got described looks like it is Blade Runner on acid. I've always had in my head as something that's really important in a venue is the outside world is totally shut off. You're in a totally different environment and you lose all, all contact with the outside world. For me, that's the sign of an amazing club is that you're totally transported away and you're just consumed by that environment. I think there is bigger appetite from people to go to a bigger show. They're happy to pay a bit more money, but they want to see high levels of production. They want something to be an event rather than just a night out. Things are just evolving, things are changing. Trying to hold up a building, pay all your staff just based on a Friday and Saturday night, that's, that's a big ask. And now I think it's a case of people finding spaces that are multi-use, you know, Monday to Friday you're doing corporate stuff, you're doing product launches, you can do evening pop-up dining. So I think London has, has had to evolve and it's had to make those decisions. It is kind of change your diary, really, so people have to kind of find new and creative and interesting ways to kind of uh, come up with concepts to make it work. But I think it's a necessary evil in some ways for yeah. the, ven the venues yeah. to have to do that because I, yeah. I don't think they'd be able to survive otherwise. We regret to announce that Dance and All is to close its doors in August. Sadly, the licensing climate in Hackney has made it impossible for us to get the hours we need to make dance more sustainable in the long term. Thanks to all the artists, DJs, promoters and family members who have shared their favourite music and moments with us over the last three and a bit years. Thank you to everyone who has made our basement such a special place. Sorry we never got round to fixing the slope in the floor. The crux of it is it doesn't work economically. There is this policy in Dalston and it is designed to make it very, very difficult to get a late license. The people who complain about clubs are often people who are more engaged with local politics. It's very difficult to fight against those odds. You know, with Dance Tunnel, it was beautiful because it was a dark, dingy tunnel with big sound and very close proximity to the DJ, etc. And it was a really nice feeling to go to, but trying to sell that to a corporate or private hire client. It's not really appealing, is it? So then you've got, let's say, only Thursday, Friday, Saturday operating for quite limited hours. That's not massively going to work. There's a couple that got engaged on Thursday here. So the week we said we were closing, I got this email from a guy who was kind of a bit angry because he'd met his girlfriend here um, for the first time and he'd always planned on proposing to her. It was only like two years ago. So I just said, oh, you should do it on the last weekend. And then not didn't hear anything back. And then he messaged me on Monday saying he's going to do it. So yeah, about half past 10 at the bar, there was like a proposal. It sounds really cheesy, but like, it's, the space is like, has obviously brought a lot of people together. 
I mean, I think it's reminded people how important these places are, not just in terms of the music and the culture of dance music, but in terms of growing up, being free, being able to experience music among friends and those kind of magic epiphanies that you have on the dance floor that are, that are you know, are things that people should get to experience. Scenes grow and evolve and communities grow and evolve and you know artistic people get pushed out because it becomes too expensive and the culture that's created by artists it exploits the people with money which doesn't make sense ever but it's this weird kind of here we go again kind of situation do you know what I mean? The economic is triumphing over the culture venues are seen as a problem or as something where people or take drugs, or do this, or do that, but that perspective has to change because there are culture centers, there are art centers, you know. In London, a lot of people don't live with their families or away from their friends. It's a place where people congregate and where, where they share moments and they share a space, you know, and they become friends, they fall in love, they decide to do a new project, etc. you know. I think everybody in the collective spirit of whatever type of music it is, drum and bass, jungle, techno, they're there for the same reason, they have these moments, amazing lights and sound and everyone's having the same thing. That's something people aren't willing to give up. There are a lot of people in parallel communities and I think it's a great leveller being in a dark, loud club. It's a great way for people to meet people who are different to them, who are different ages, from different backgrounds, different races, different sexualities. And that's why people move to London in the first place. That is the energy that creates opportunities and culture in London. Whatever your identity is, nightlife plays an important role. And it helps us discover our identities, discover who we are. In these uncertain times, we need to be clear to the rest of the world that London is ready for business, London welcomes people and ideas, London nurtures its nighttime economy and culture, and London is open. Thank you. Good, good, good. So, I'm going to hold it. Hi, Amy. First of all, I think it's fantastic that um, your role has been given the clout that it has, and it's fantastic to have someone as energising as you in the role. Thank you. Um, I'm 25, and I try to go out clubbing every single weekend, and already there are places that I have been which no longer exist. I'm talking about Dance Tunnel, I'm talking about Passing Clouds, I'm talking about Black Cap. My real fear is that this city is sleepwalking into oblivion, that the nighttime economy is disappearing, and this city is becoming one of the most boring capital cities in Europe. My phone has been almost like a hotline for venues at risk and at City Hall we have just appointed a venues at risk officer to deal specifically with this because it's unacceptable. The Mayor of London recognises that we're losing too many spaces, this needs to stop. I think London is far more exciting than we give it credit for. You know, when we take the, our eye off the ball, of course things are going to happen that, that are detrimental, but we win hands down in terms of diversity of nightlife anywhere in the world. I challenge any other city in the world to try and beat us in our diversity. The summer is always London's dying. And you know, you could say Turnmills is closed, the end is closed, the cross is closed. But you know what, Oval Space opened, XOY opened, Phonox opened, Tobacco Dock started. Studio spaces became a thing under the Hydro. The Bussy building is a packed out thousand capacity venue every single Friday, Saturday. I mean, if you look at this Friday, you've got Red Light One Man, Roscoe and Casper playing Fabric Live, Route 94 at the Egg, Andy C's XOY residency, Beautiful Swimmers at Oval Space, Nick Hopner and Shanty Sess at Trouble Vision, Dusky Live, Hatcher at The Nest, and Calton and Peverlist at Royal Bankhead at Phonox, and Optimo at Village Underground. I mean, that's what? That's that's seven or eight like lineups that if you put those on in any small regional town, 
people would absolutely flock to them. Venues always crop up. You know, there were lots of spaces in London that our core demographic wouldn't even be aware of. That are great spaces that maybe do things slightly differently. It'd be nice to think we can open that up a little bit. We first heard about the tank because one of our members of the collective was living with Leah and we came down and had a look at it, thought, great, this is exactly the kind of space we want to do an event in. It's small, it's unknown, it's visually exciting, sonically exciting. Siren is a collective that we started in January 2016 now. We were quite frustrated with the lack of women also doing what we were doing and decided to just start throwing parties that were promoting that specifically within techno. That table will be fine. It's quite low, but we can put it on bricks. I mean, coming from a pretty DIY perspective, any space is a potential space. You just need to be able to make it work. Yes, perfect. Uh, unfortunately, this is the penultimate event tonight, and tomorrow we have the last one um, due to the redevelopment in London. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty sad after being open for three months. The lack of small venues in London, it really chokes innovation and creativity. You do one experimental night, that person plays out for the first time in a new city and more people hear about them and then they go on to a slightly bigger venue, but if that's not happening, we probably can't yet know the impact that it will have on people not of having had these spaces to experiment in and to do something a bit different. I think London faces a tough time. I think capitalism and the government make things difficult for our culture. It's, it's tough because we don't necessarily make lots of money, even though as an industry we are probably worth a lot of money, but um, I think when it comes to the more underground stuff, it's not easy. Hello, Rowax. Hello. All of the music that I grew up listening to was music that was formed <laughs> through things like pirate radio, small clubs where kids could go and take risks and, you know, try and impress their friends. Like, everyone wanted to have the biggest and best tunes. There is, like, a really, really direct link between the rate of change in music in London and, like, having these, like, small community enterprises and stuff. Like, I think it's really essential. Selling records is definitely not something you can really make much of a profit margin on. You kind of have to do pretty extreme volumes to really be able to kind of keep a good staff base and pay rent in London. And I think if we were just a record shop, certainly we wouldn't be able to operate at this kind of level without the bar feeding into that a little bit. Have you heard Joe's new one yet? That's worth a listen. First release on his new label. It's all kind of South African oh, housey yeah. stuff. So this is, um, are you running this with Tom? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I got the, I'll, I'll take yeah, you got the digi there. Yeah, nice. like A lot of the conversation around London recently has focused on this idea of the nighttime economy or something like this. To me, I feel like that kind of focus on nightlife's economic contribution to the city kind of forgets about like the places that are the real kind of drivers of like innovation and new music, which I think fundamentally are places like this. I do like having a few cheesy sevens in. That's a whole heap of shit there. Oh my god. Yeah, I know, right, it's, yeah, it's bad. Like, well, to be fair, I bet we sell all of these. <laughs> it's kind of like a bit of a geek's paradise, I suppose, Rolex, in that you can just come down here and there's quite a lot of, we have quite a lot of strange regulars who are really lovely people who kind of, we will just live down here more or less. It's almost like that weird person that everyone knew's bedroom that they always just, everyone used to hang out in, yeah, yeah. but it's that all the time. I like that um, I kind of like uh, MC Det's birthday bash is still like a way to time what yeah. time of year it is. Yeah. Like at a certain point of the year, you're just like, oh, MC Det's birthday bash, posters are up. <laughs> I think it's important that people like us don't lose sight of what it is that got us into this whole thing in the first place, which wasn't the, you know, the financial contribution that music makes to a city or something. It was about community and about the cultural value of music in a city.
is good, everyone. It's Moxie here, NTS. The people that are behind the station, it comes from love and from craft. When it started, it wasn't from money. It's still not about money. It's just about making a community, building that, and making really good radio. We're going to be with you until 5 p.m. Let us know where you're at. Myself, at DJ Moxie, and at NTS Live. To have shows from people who just find Japanese soundtracks and play just that kind of music because they're obsessed with it is a great thing. And to bring them all together on NTS is a feat, really. It's always just been part of our culture. So much more, I suppose, in the 90s when, when Pirate Radio was really thriving. And every single dial, there would be like a different garage station or like a different kind of rare groove station. It just seems so intrinsic within our community and within London. It's such a London thing. For me, growing up as a teen, I used to listen to Pirate Radio, I used to listen to this station cool FM that I was absolutely obsessed with. So like write them letters and stuff like that, I was like totally obsessed. I think it's absolutely brilliant when I see like clips on Instagram and stuff like that of like young kids like excited to go on radio because it started to die down a little bit. I guess a lot of what's going on now can seem quite isolating, like the idea that everything is kind of happening like on the internet first. And I think radio forms an important like real world context for a lot of this music. I think it's important, especially in London in 2017, when clubs are shutting down and we don't have the space that there once was to kind of congregate and have a community. This is the office. This is where like the hub of everything is. It's an office, but to be honest with you, in the evenings, especially after six, it feels more like a youth centre than anything else, to be honest with you. Like, I think, you know, for a lot of people, they just want somewhere comfortable, warm, with Wi-Fi and a bathroom, and they kind of just get on with it, really. What's good? My shoes are off, they've been off all day. The floor's really dirty as well. But 6 p.m. on your Thursday evening, my name is Amy Becker. This is the acrylic show, and we're starting with Harlem Spartans. This is Kent Nizzy. Kent Nizzy, Kent Nizzy, brown and pretty, love to lurk around Harlem City. We have an open door policy, obviously not completely, but we do, and it means that anyone can come and sit down and hang out and do whatever, and it's just like, some people might roll through, whatever might happen, it's different all the time. When we first started, like, and it was just me kind of doing everything, it would be like two, three nights a week, I would like sleep on the sofa, just to like, because it would be like finished quite late, like three in the morning, and the next DJ would come at like 10. You can do what you want, you can say what you want. I think, like Ollie's line, tuning off, fuck off, is like the whole thing that embodies radar is that it is literally just crack on and get stuck in. We've got people practicing here from like 10 in the morning till midnight. On Friday nights, I'm quite regularly like, things will stay open till like four or five, like Friday had gone like six in the morning, just people want to come here and just practice and just, you know. It's cheaper than a club, like, yeah, I mean, you can bring your own drinks, everything like that, so. How's it going, all good? Yeah. All good. Right, so this is the main studio here. This is Josie. Hi. <laughs> the studio was set up for MCs, so that's why everything's so far forward, so you've got so much space here. But we've had sets where it's like, 30, 40 people in the room. It's literally, it's like a 20 person queue, one in, one out, just to get in. It's fucking nuts. That's way we pass the station. You don't want to get left in the bed. Hey, 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 I was like, hey, yes, I'm going to go like that. You want to work with me? It's quite interesting to have a space where there's so many people kind of in different scenes can all intersect and link up. There's like a lot of kind of cross-pollination that happens here that you wouldn't be able to get probably anywhere else. When it comes to grime, radio is a really big part of that scene. You can't really be an MC if you can't shower on radio. Like you have to have this like capacity in you to take the mic. It's really unpredictable. You need to be able to freestyle. It's quite under pressure, especially if we're filming. And 
if you flop, like, you're going to lose credit very quickly because it's really important that you can do it. You're not the sharpest tool in the shed and you're not the one to be fooling a fed. Got bare bait shit on your Instagram. What are you going to do when it hits the fan? You was in the club screaming out no new friends with a guy that you met last month. I was in the middle what? of cutting off loose ends. Brethren, don't believe that front. What? Man, I might have to slap what for? Oli is definitely very important and will be very important in years to come. We do feel part of history sometimes when we're filming things and watching it back and I'm like, this is something people are going to watch back in 20 years' time and be like, this is proper, like, this is history of London, of, of London culture and music. This is not like a fad for me or a hobby, this is a real commitment. I've been doing it professionally now for seven years, working at various stations and labels and stuff like that. So with this, it's just more like, OK, cool, like, where do you want to be in like five years' time? Stations like One Extra and Beats are definitely a big inspiration for where we want to go. So we thought, why not have the studios here and kind of see where things can go, really. Save Our Culture is the campaign that we launched after we had our licence revoked and that was to help us have enough finances to get through the appeal process and to instigate change in licensing law. The groundswell of support and the willingness for them to dip into their pockets to help us out in this situation is, is been phenomenal. I don't think at the heart of it I was too surprised at the kind of the reaction and how it galvanised the core group. I think where it then rippled out from was the surprising factor that, that, that people who don't go to clubs, never really were into the scene, saw it as a attack or erosion of, of uh, you know, some kind of cultural institution. And that, I think, was the really strong and surprising factor was just how wide that ripple effect was. Last September, Fabric was closed. But under stricter licensing rules, it will reopen, promising to boost security. Me and Judy have been arguing, Craig's been arguing, not as in arguing, but letting a lot of stuff out. I think all of us buried so much emotion over the last three or four months. And when it's suddenly, you know you're opening in this week, straight after New Year's Eve, I think it's all come out of us. Just because we were scared, you know, it was such walking into the unknown. I felt broken hearted at one point and angry at other points. And now, of course, we do have a hope and I hope we can change a few things and that it will be a, a better club. I think the lesson we learned from Fabric is actually just how important it is to get people around the table and to talk about situations before they escalate. It shows the importance of being able to convene police, local authorities, club owners, punters, you know, security staff around a table to actually have these conversations. We've got a bigger welfare team, we've got a welfare centre, we've got drug awareness, and the police and council, are, we've all got on the, the same page as where education and, and awareness of the danger of drugs is gonna be the thing that moves everything forward for the city. We've got our club back. That's the biggest thing that's putting a smile on my face today, is we got our club back, yeah. still very challenging for a lot of people in authority to come to terms with the sort of validity of clubs and dance music as a legitimate cultural activity because it's messy. <laughs> it is messy and we can't like pretend that it's not but we have to find a way to sort of make it work where people are safe rather than pretending that it's not going to happen. It's what makes people want to come here. It's, it's a real pull for, um, for tourism, for creativity and other cities have recognised it, like Berlin, like Amsterdam, and I think we're, we're lagging a bit behind. And I don't think this whole conservative Brexit mindset is, is really helping. Politically, things are shifting massively at the moment. You look at America and the chaos over there and, and Brexit, and actually our culture was born out of kind of oppression of, of, of freedom and, and, and crushing of spirits, and actually we do our best work when we're in the trenches. Creativity needs something to bounce off. It's good that I think that politics is swerving to the right because it gives something for people to go, hang on a minute, just not speak to me. 
When Rave first started, you were doing political things, even though you probably didn't realise you were necessarily doing something political. But if you're breaking into a building and finding ways around the law, and you're gathering hundreds of people together, that's a political act, you know? That's a freedom of movement political act. And it's expression. The passion and potentially anger will come through. And there's so much of that in London. I think you, your extremes are massive. God knows how anybody is still homeless in London. It's insane, but if you're walking down the street and you see that next to a million pound bonus banker, you're gonna get angry. Having an outlet, whether that be going to a, a venue for a, a music event or a club, or going home, creating music, going to the studio, etc. you know, it's the one outlet that you really need. This is the time, if people have got no money, if things are shutting down, if there's empty buildings in the city, the stage is being set for something. What's really reassuring is that we're not done, do you know what I mean? It's like, we're not done. Art culture always finds a way, always. Frat history always finds a way. You can buy culture, but you can't buy realness. You can't buy authenticity, no way. And that's what we're on this planet to do.